Ladies, gents, hello, how's it going? Random Gary here. Um, bit of a different video today. I'm going to do a reaction video today. One of my pals um, seen this video online and he said, um, I think it would be amazing if you were to to have a look at it and, and share your thoughts as, as you're rolling through it. Um, the reason he said this was, um, this is actually the first ever Medal of Honor recorded um, in history. And um, I spent 12 years in the British Army. Um, during my time in the British Army, I received uh, Britain's second highest award for, for gallantry, the, the Conspicuous Gallantry Cross. And he said, I think it might resonate with you, mate. Um, I would go, go, have a look at it and tell us what you think. So here we are. He told me to get a beer ready. So I've got a beer and we're going to watch this video together. Let's see where this takes us. Chapman, a U.S. Air Force combat controller, and the SEALs are attempting to rescue their lost teammate. So straight away. Um, 4th of March 2002 was the action. Um, in the British Honours and Awards system, it's a very short period of time. So, so the action that I was involved in happened on the 14th of March 2009. And on the 14th of March 2010, I was actually informed personally uh, behind all the, the, the glare of the media and anybody else in the world that I was going to receive a significant award. So ours is a one year period. I think this was only awarded a couple of years ago, so you're looking um, close to 20 years potentially in the American system. You'll watch Chapman's heroic actions as he saves the lives of his entire SEAL team and then another 18 members of a quick reaction force, earning America's highest award, the Medal of Honor. Chapman and the SEALs exfil their MH-47 helicopter. John is the second individual to exit and immediately moves in the direction of the summit. He can be seen moving off to the right of the screen, alone. The team is taking heavy fire from every direction, as indicated by the arrows, as Chapman begins engaging targets. So, plus and minuses of um, airborne assault here. One, you can get right on top of the enemy positions extremely quickly, but... As the parachute regiment found out in World War II, quite often you're surrounded whenever you do these kind of jobs. And it looks like these guys find themselves in that same position. And only a very small number actually getting off that helo. They they can transport quite a, a few bods and we've only got a handful here. So, wow, this is, this is ballsy. You can see spent cartridges ejecting from his M4. Chapman then begins closing with the enemy, forcing his way upslope in knee and thigh deep snow. He is constantly under fire as he does this. Chapman's team leader begins to close on Chapman, following his trail through the snow. The dark mass above Chapman is a fortified bunker containing two enemy fighters, each armed with AK 47s, who are firing down on the team in the darkness horrible place to be in. You're attacking a prepared defensive position. You're in the low ground. You're having to attack uphill to an enemy that's already prepared this place. Sh shit can go bad really quickly. This bunker will come to be known as bunker number one. To the left of the tree and bunker one is another gray mass. This is a rock outcropping that came to be called the boulder. Between Bunker 1 and this boulder can be seen the body of slain SEAL Neil Roberts, the man Chapman and the others are attempting to recover. Chapman, still alone and closest to the enemy, pauses to engage targets as his team leader follows him, but never actually catches up with him. Chapman on his own, now makes the decision to charge directly into the enemy bunker, despite withering point-blank fire. Chapman, now literally on top of the enemy, engages the two combatants and kills them, saving the lives of the remaining SEALs. Just a quick one there, he said that the team leader didn't actually get up to Chapman. Quite often in these situations, you wouldn't get too close to people. The closer you are, the bigger the target you are, so it's actually beneficial to stay away. And also, as Chapman leads the charge here, it looks like the team leader is being the, the point um, of fire. So being that final person who's engaged in the enemy position and, and suppressing it to allow John Chapman to get into it. I absolutely love what the narrator's doing, calling him John Chapman here, rather than his military rank. I think whenever you talk about these instances and you 
call somebody by their rank, I think it dehumanizes them. Let's keep calling him John Chapman. He does this from a distance of no more than 10 feet. These actions by themselves earned him his first Medal of Honor. He then climbs into and takes control of the bunker. First Medal of Honor. First. We're two minutes into an eight minute video. Having cleared the immediate threat, Chapman is then joined by his team leader in Bunker 1. You can then see Chapman and his team leader engaging the next bunker, known as Bunker 2, which is situated to the left edge of the screen. This bunker, manned by a handful of Chechen and Uzbek fighters, also contains a heavy PKM machine gun, hand grenades, and rocket-propelled grenades. John Chapman is shot twice at this time in the torso and collapses, incapacitated. So Chechnyan fighters in there, extremely um, experienced um, area when, whenever it comes to warfare. Uh, also, that, that second bunker position, it looked like it was elevated. It looked like it had arcs of fire down into bunker one. If I was to see a position set up like that, straight away you know you're working against people who really know what they're doing. Quite often, enemy forces would set up bunkers that have crossing arcs of fire. If you've got one bunker in front and a second bunker behind where that second bunker can engage into it, they're planning on this massive delay. They don't want you to get an upper hand by getting in a bunker and being able to use that to your advantage. So everything that you're seeing here is just saying these, these guys are operators, they know what they're at. You are now looking at a new angle and at the left of the screen. Uh, I, I paused that at the perfect moment. Look at that big muzzle flash going off there. This person here is winning the firefight. They've got themselves in the position where they can just lay down absolute crazy amount of fire. And it's, it's strange because it's not like you would imagine it in the movies. You're not actually shooting at people in this kind of situation. You're shooting into likely firing positions. So places where you think the enemy could engage you from. And you're just trying to keep their heads down. You're trying to prevent them from getting up and getting engaged in you so they can win the firefight. So you're just putting as many rounds down as you can into likely firing positions. Green can be seen the two-man fire team and team leader on top of the boulder. Just below it is Bunker 1 with the mortally wounded Chapman. One SEAL can be seen firing his modified M60 machine gun from the hip into Bunker 2 on the right side of the screen until he is struck by grenade shrapnel and tumbles 10 feet off the top of the boulder, collapsing at the feet of his team leader, thus setting off a chain of events that would lead to the SEALs abandoning Chapman on the summit. The wounded SEAL and the team leader can be seen conferring about his injuries. Moments later, the SEALs decide to retreat from the summit because their position is untenable in the face of continued massive enemy firepower. They can be seen moving toward the right side of the screen and passing the body of Neil Roberts. Unfortunately, the SEALs do not pass John Chapman, who is above them and inside Bunker 1. This is the reality of war, guys. Sometimes you're in a situation where you just need to reorg. You just need to... The, the, the get away from that engagement zone so you can decide what you need to do next. It doesn't sound nice. It's not really something that you you like to talk about, but it's it's the reality. It's it's just making the best of a really shitty situation. This angle shows three seals in a triangle. The larger black heat signature is a smoke grenade. Just to its left is a donkey and dead Al Qaeda fighter killed by Chapman. The steepness of the mountain can be seen as the seals begin to slide down the near sheer face. That explains why the helo came in so close. You cannot fight up terrain like that effectively, especially into a really well prepared defensive position. These guys probably knew exactly what they were landing into and they all went ahead with it. Everyone an absolute warrior. The team leader, desperate for relief and now with two wounded teammates, asks for uncontrolled airstrikes from an orbiting Air Force AC-130 gunship. The impacts you see are from 105mm howitzer rounds being fired onto the ridgetop 
in order to save the remaining SEALs. Because neither the SEALs nor gunship know Chapman is alive, he is experiencing these detonations from his position. So I wasn't afford air controller in my time. I was part of a tactical air control party, and I was also a very experienced artillery controller. Now, if you're given uncontrolled uh, kind of airstrikes, if you're given that freedom up to the pilot, you're really in the shit. Things have went bad. Normally, you have this real procedure that you have to stick to rigidly, and that prevents any danger from from happening to yourself or to your your team around you or to any innocent civilians. Now, I'm not going to get into the, our specifics, our our technical stuff, uh, just for operational security. But um, each one of these 105 rounds that are being engaged from the aircraft, if I was using them from ground to ground, so from an artillery piece actually engaging the ground, I would plan for them to have a lethal splinter distance of, let's say, 800 meters. 800 meters isn't too far out. That means within 800 meters of that 105 shell going off, you could be killed by the splinters, for, by the shrapnel coming off it. So John Chapman, he's on this hill. He's experiencing these landing deadly close to him, dangerously close. He will also be aware that they're being walked over the hill. Um, if I was him, I would know I was on my own there. They will, the rest of the team will have pulled away. There's no way they would call us in with the rest of the guys being here. And the fact they're calling it in, they probably think I've been killed. They probably think I'm not alive anymore. At approximately 5.20 in the morning, Chapman recovers and begins to engage the enemy. Bunker 1 is on the right side center of the screen and Bunker 2 to the left near the screen center. It will never be known what caused his incapacitation and recovery. Of the two rounds that originally wounded him, at least one was mortal and at this time he is experiencing severe blood loss and shock. Despite that, he begins his one-man stand against two dozen enemy combatants. During this time, Chapman initiates a series of radio calls, many of which are heard by a fellow combat controller and teammate of his and Delta Force operators on a nearby summit. Despite this combat controller's replies, Chapman never acknowledges whether because of damage to his equipment or himself will never be known. This new angle and footage shows Chapman at the top, identified by the green dot under the tree at Bunker 1. The lower center of the screen shows the first enemy fighter who is about to charge Chapman in the hopes of killing the American. The timestamp at the bottom shows it is now 6.05 in the morning and fully light. He's been fighting alone now for 40 plus minutes and has received more gunshot and shrapnel wounds as a result of the fierce combat. This scene shows the second of several enemy charges. In this stunning display of determination and courage, Chapman can be seen fighting hand to hand with the fighter. In the larger screen display can be seen additional enemy moving on to the summit. But right now, John Chapman is fighting for his life. Six minutes later, in this new shot, Chapman can hear another helicopter approaching the summit. He is in the bottom center of the screen underneath the tree and can be seen in the magnified inset box as he begins his desperate final stand to save the lives of the 18 men on the helicopter. I don't think they're even playing that up. Um, you've seen how close the first helo had to land. Making the assumption the second helo is going to have to come that close. And you only have to look into the past to the likes of Operation Red Wings, where the, the, the quick reaction force got sent out to pick up the Lone Survivor Patrol. And on their, their drop-off, one of their helos was hit. I think it was by an RPG. And I believe they lost all souls on board. So to say that he's fighting for that helo coming in, it's... Absolutely right. The red dots are enemy fighters. John begins engaging the enemy in multiple directions and is rapidly approaching the last of his ammunition. The helicopter contains a quick reaction force comprised of rangers, pararescue men, and another combat controller. It is now 613 and the helicopter is short final. The enemy is desperately trying to displace Chapman so they can put heavy weapons or rocket-propelled grenades in Bunker 1 while simultaneously engaging the helicopter. With the choice to save his life or the lives of his unknown comrades, Chapman makes the decision to climb out of the bunker and begin firing in multiple directions as can be seen in the inset. Suffering from as many as a dozen wounds, Chapman is in fact already in the process of dying. 
As he fights, the helicopter is struck by a rocket-propelled grenade and makes a remarkable controlled crash just below Chapman and the summit. Chapman, now off-screen, continues to cover his comrades as they pour out of the stricken helicopter. Some of them are fatally shot as they exit. These images, with Chapman fighting the enemy at close quarter, are the last to show him alive and in this heroic act, thus qualifying for his second Medal of Honor. Ultimately, Chapman would expend all but the last few rounds of his ammunition, until, finally, after 16 bullet and shrapnel wounds, Chapman succumbs when he is shot through the heart. We will never know his final thoughts or words, but what we do know is, his decisions and actions single-handedly saved the lives of 23 comrades. For more information about John Chapman's amazing story and the details about this mission, visit danchillingbooks.com or your favorite book retailer to obtain a copy of The Chronicle of His Life, Alone at Dawn. Dan Schilling, your voiceover, what you just put together there, completely humbling. If you had seen that, on video, on a movie, you would have called bullshit. I would have called bullshit. You would have said, that's impossible, that couldn't happen. Um, That was incredible. Absolutely incredible. Dan said at the end, we, we don't know what John was thinking. I think I do. I think he was thinking, I need to save my buddies. I need to do what I can to allow these guys to get on this, this kind of hilltop. And I'm absolutely blown away by what I've seen. Speechless. Hands are sweaty. I've got goosebumps. Wow. Impressive. I'm going to go off and buy this book. I would absolutely love it if you guys could buy this book as well. I think this is a, a story that needs to be heard and a story that needs to be told. Um, Please comment below. What did you think of this video? Something very different from me. Never done one of these reaction ones before, but I can see now why my pal recommended it. Um, hope you's not enjoyed it, but hope you's were inspired by that. That was amazing. And I'll see you guys soon. Have a good one.